All right, so uh, synthesis transformation here. So we're going to be looking at uh, going from this alcohol to this, this uh, alkene type product. But the other thing that's a little bit tricky here is that we have to add some carbons. Uh, so in this, this structure, we have one, two, three, four carbons. This one, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, so everybody see that? Um, so that means that we need to add two carbons to this, plus also end up with an alkene here. Um, so this might be a little, uh, a little bit tricky. Let's see what we can do here. First, we're going to start by just kind of thinking about this, analyzing it the way that I just talked about. So we're going to be cleaving uh, there. Uh, we can think of these two carbons as being essentially new, um, newly added on. And in a way, this actually makes this a little bit easier because there's really only one way that we know where we can add um, where we can add carbons, where we can make carbon-carbon bonds. That is through uh, acetylene, acetylide type substitution. So, um, dealing with this double bond first. So we we know that there's various ways we can make double bonds from uh, elimination or through elimination. So we assume that this is probably going to come from. Um, you know, some kind of thing like this, where there's some kind of a leaving group here, and we can eliminate that. Um, so then if we again turn our attention to, and we can deal with the specific reagents later, but if we again turn our attention to how are we going to make this carbon-carbon bond? Um, in reality, there's lots of ways you can make carbon-carbon bonds, but for us, there's really only one thing that we've that we've learned so far, and that is to take something like this with a leaving group and do a substitution with an acetylide ion like this, followed by a reduction. Right, so we would add the carbons by acetylide substitution and then reduce it. Of course, that's going to get rid of the leaving group. So we need to start with Something that has two leaving groups, which is not, if I'm looking at this, so you see what I'm doing here. So we have some halide or whatever here. We're substituting with the acetylide to make this with a triple bond and then reducing the triple bond away. Um, the problem is, this is not something that we've really seen from here, right? Like an alcohol turning into like a dihalide like this, um, it's probably not going to work. But so that that's like a first try and we go, eh, I don't know. I don't know if I can make this. Let's try something else. What if instead of a leaving group here, we have a leaving group over here? And we can deal with what that leaving group is later. Then we have something that's a little bit more, A little bit more reasonable because we know we can do something like a dibromine, and now this thing starts to come into shape. Um, so we can make this from this kind of an alkene through a, a let's say we do a bromination, so then these become bromine. And how do we know that this is going to be selective over here? Well, we don't necessarily, but we know that we're not going to do that SN2 substitution on the tertiary carbon here. So we're just kind of hoping that we can control the conditions to make it fast enough where the SN2 here is um, happens faster than the E2 elimination from, from over here. 
so uh, then from here, we know that we can make this through dehydration. So heating that up with concentrated sulfuric acid. Um, we can get the alkene. We can dibrominate the alkene, do one substitution here for the acetylide, and then um, reduce it, leaving bromine leaving group here, which we can then eliminate to form the final. All right, so that's how I do something like that. And then K and M. Those. So this is OH, by the way. Um, so, K, again, um, one thing that can be helpful here is when you see a group that some part of the molecule where we know that there's only one way that we've really been ever dealing with that particular um, type of thing in terms of putting it on to another compound, that can help us to figure out what that's going to be. And so, in this case, with nitrogen, there's a whole chapter later, I don't think we're going to get to it this semester, but there's a whole chapter on amines, about how you make amines, how you deal with amines. But for now, really the only way that we've ever dealt with amines is through, um, is through substitution. And the fact that it is beta to this alcohol here makes me think of epoxide. So anytime you have a functional group that's put on or something that's put on next to a carbon that has an alcohol, that's a good indication that epoxides are involved there. Because we know that we can open up epoxides like this. And with um, strong nu nucleophiles in basic conditions, we can preferentially attack the less substituted side of the epoxide, so right here. So we would expect to open that up um, that way. And then once we see that, we can see that the epoxides we always make from alkenes using peroxy acids. So something like that. Any questions about that one? Um, moving on then for this one, again, we have a similar situation. We have some stereochemistry here, um, but we have, again, a nitrogen-based functional group that is beta to an alcohol. So one, you know, one, this is the alpha carbon that's connected to the alcohol, and then this would be the next one over. So um, we've got nitrogen attack there, which opens the epoxide there. So we can imagine this as coming from... This kind of epoxide. We don't have to draw the stereochemistry here because it's racemic anyway. Um, but, and then this would be an ethyl amine. So CH3, CH2, uh, sorry, NH. NH2, like that. Um, and then again, we make the epoxide through the epoxidation with the peroxy acids. So that's a good um, a good thing to keep in mind here when you see these sorts of things where the something is added next to the carbon that has an alcohol. That's a good indication that you've got something uh, epoxide going on. And you see a similar thing here. Uh, all right, questions about those? Thank you for suggesting those problems. Those are good examples from chapter eight. All right. Um, let me pull up the chapter nine stuff a second.
Okay, I think we're good now. So, um, okay, so before we go into this, um, just creatively about the exam, my thought originally was to that, uh, as I mentioned last week, that we that I would kind of post the exam now as we're getting into chapter nine and you could work through it. Um, but we're, we're really behind from the original schedule and I'm fine with that. Um, I'm also concerned just about the amount of workload and amount of stuff that you all have to do uh, with everything that's going on. So um, I am going to post some kind of exam eventually, uh, and then you'll have a long time to work on it. Um, I, we, we've still got plenty of weeks left in the semester, so I would rather wait a little bit, talk through this week, and then next week post an exam, and again, give you maybe a couple weeks um, to work on that exam. I think uh, everything's just taking a lot longer right now, and, and we all just need more time for stuff. So um, that's what's going on with that. I also want to post a quiz for Chapter 9, the aromatic stuff, and do the quiz before we do the exam as normal. So um, I'll be posting the quiz this week. You'll have a week to work on that, and then, um, and then we'll post the exam after that. The final exam... Um, is going to be um, same kind of thing. We've we've had a lot of uh, of trouble trying to do anything timed because people's internet connections are unreliable and sometimes stuff goes down. Sometimes people have technical difficulties and whatever. So the final exam is going to end up being um, the same type of format. The final um, multiple choice or written, it'll probably be, um, that's a good question, I don't know. It'll probably be a mix. It'll probably be a mix. It, we don't use a, like a national standardized exam for this class like we do with the uh, Gen Chem or the other organic classes. So it'll be something that I put together. Um, as, as we had planned earlier, your questions would be part of the exam. For the ones that you've already put You've already submitted in class as part of the quizzes. Um, I'll definitely look through and try to use some of those as we had agreed earlier. If, um, but uh, it's going to be, it's going to be the same kind of thing as our other exam. So I'll give you at least a week to work on the the final exam. Um, will there be a study guide for the final? Yeah. Um, yeah, there will be some some kind of study guide for the final. Um, I mean, ideally, just the other exams and the quizzes and things will make a pretty good study guide. I um, like, I'm sure many of you don't have a lot of time. Um, thing is kids and everything. So, um, I you know, you can probably expect to see a lot of questions on the final coming straight from old quizzes and exams because um, they're already there. But, uh, you know, we'll do what we can. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's head into aromatics again. So on, um, on Wednesday, we talked about aromatic structures, about what makes something aromatic, why that's a special kind of a stability, ideas about that. Today, we're gonna look at some naming and then get into some reactions of benzenes. So first, uh, just to remind ourselves again, This is benzene. And only that structure is benzene. So if it does not have three double bonds like this, or as we know that sometimes, as we talked about, it's sometimes written with a circle because of the resonance. But if it's not that, it's not benzene. So cyclohexane is not benzene, right? Cyclohexane is C6H12. Benzene is C6H6. They are not isomers. They are not related, except that they 
both kind of look similar because of hexagons, but don't because they're hexagons, but don't get those mixed up. They're very different structures with very different chemistry. Okay. Um, if benzene is a substituent on something else, so let's say we have some big molecule and there's a benzene ring on it. This particular, and this is a little bit confusing, but this particular substituent is called phenyl. And there's another substituent where the benzene is connected via a CH2, so one carbon away. And that whole thing is called benzyl. So that's confusing because you'd think benzyl is just the ring, but benzyl is the ring plus a carbon. And we'll talk about why that's a special position in a little bit. Um, so if you if you have things like um, this molecule, you would think that it would be named something like benzol, but it's not. It's actually named phenol or phenol. And again, fairly confusingly, if there is a CH2 there, then this becomes benzyl alcohol. Oops, think about it later. Okay. So that phenyl versus benzyl thing can be a little bit uh, confusing. So monosubstituted benzene derivatives, so benzene with one thing attached, they often have uh, common names that are not systematic. So things that you just have to memorize. Uh, in this class, again, you don't really have to memorize it. Our assessments are, you know, without notes. Um, but in a normal class setting, or if you're taking a MCAT or something like that, then you would have to know some of these benzene derivatives. So these are all on page um, 273, 274 in your book. But some of the really common ones that we're going to be using and that we're going to be talking about are uh, phenol, if there's a methyl group here, is toluene, which is a really common uh, solvent in the lab. If there's an NH2, that's called aniline. is benzaldehyde. Aldehyde there. And we've got the carboxylic acid, which is benzoic acid, which you've used in lab. We've got the, the methyl ether, which is called anise. And those are the ones we'll deal with for now. Uh, the all of the um, halo benzene, so halides, bromine, chlorine, iodine, are named as expected. So We had, for instance, this would just be 
fluorobenzene. So that is a little easier at least. Um, so these names will be popping up, again, because of the way that we're doing our class this semester. You don't have to memorize all of these, but you will see them used in the homework and in class. So just keep in mind that, that they will be showing up. If we look at dye-substituted benzenes, So these are benzenes with two substituents. They are they can be named by the relationship between the two substituents around the ring. So just like where one is in relation to the other. Uh, so for example, we said that this is toluene. So if we put a bromine on here. We don't call this 1-bromo-4-methylbenzene. We call this part toluene, and so this becomes bromotoluene. Uh, there's two different ways that we can name this, both of which are correct. We can call this four bromotoluene. So making the carbon that has the the substituent that's causing the name. So this, this has priority here because it is what makes this thing toluene. And then we count around the ring for the different positions. Uh, one, two, three, four. And we've got four bromotoluene. But there's another name that we sometimes use for this also. And that is p-bromotoluene or para. Um, and so to explain these, let's take a look at a benzene ring. And let's say that this position here is the number one position, the, the thing that's attached that's causing the name, whatever that is, OK? So then we can have a substituent in three different places on the ring relative to that one. Because it can either be here, here, or here. See those three different positions? They're mirrored on the other side. And because benzene is flat and symmetrical, this position is equivalent to this position. Um, again, so these two equivalent positions here and here that are right next to or one carbon away from whatever the main thing is that's naming it, it's not an oxygen, by the way. It's just, we're just saying that's like the main, the number one position. Um, these things are called ortho or O. ones two away are called meta or M. And then the one that's all the way across the ring in the four position is called para or P. So we can call this or, uh, four bromotoluene. We can also call it para bromotoluene because the bromine is para to the methyl group that's making it toluene or all the way across the ring. Look at another one. So this one we could call three fluoroaniline. Uh, can anybody type in the uh, alternative to that name? What else could we call that besides 3-chloroaniline? Or say, if you'd rather. Yeah. 
Yeah, very good. Thank you, Irina. Metachloroaniline. So we could call that one. We could call that one meta instead. So um, ortho, meta, para. This only works for di-substituted benzenes, two things. Because once you have more than two, you don't have a meta-para relationship anymore because there's multiple relationships among the, the different substituents. So if we had something like this, So this one we would also name toluene because of the methyl group, but we can't say that it's ortho this and meta that necessary or para that because these things are also have a, a meta relationship. And so once you get to more substituents, you really just have to use the numbers. So this one would be um, this one would be four chloro nitro toluene. This is not a substituent that, or a group that we've seen a whole lot, a functional group that we've talked about a lot, but it does become important in benzene chemistry. So this is called a nitro group. Um, while we're talking about that, it's this. There's actually two formal charges in that group, um, and, and we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. All right, um, any questions so far about naming or anything like that? Some other um, interesting aromatic compounds. I'm just actually going to copy these over instead of trying to draw them. They're called poly, the book calls them polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, they're also known as polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. They kind of look like honeycombs. They're a bunch of benzene rings smashed together. So like that. Um, these are important for a couple reasons. They're they're industrially important. Things like naphthalene, um, which is uh, like mothballs, sometimes used as a, a insect repellent. And then as you get into these, especially like this one, these these are products of incomplete combustion. So when you burn something, and there's not a pure oxygen environment, generally anytime you burn something, it's not there's not enough oxygen around. And that's why there's always smoke and ash and black stuff always left after the burning uh, because, because there's not enough oxygen for complete combustion. So when you burn things, there's not enough oxygen for complete combustion. These are some of the products of those things. And these are highly carcinogenic, especially this one. But any of, uh, most of these are, are, are carcinogenic, and which is why smoking is so, one more reason why smoking is so dangerous incomplete combustion, and then you're inhaling the products of that incomplete combustion into your lungs, um, which are then carcinogenic. But you also find these anytime there's incomplete combustion. So when you are cooking, when you're grilling things and you're, you know, getting those nice kind of blackened marks on your food, um, that's also carcinogenic. When you're smoking food, um, you know, smoked meats, bacon, smoked fish, stuff like that, those are also there's also carcinogenic molecules in there, um, and they're mostly of this type from the incomplete combustion.
All right, I, I told you we'd talk a little bit more about the benzylic position. We're going to do that now. So the here, it's the carbon right away, one away from uh, an alkene. And the thing that's special about that, a couple things. One is you have, you can do stuff to that carbon that you could, that doesn't affect the benzene. Normally, if we had just an, a chain of a hydrocarbon chain that was not benzene, we couldn't use like really strong um, reagents on it because you just kind of break the whole thing apart. Um, so for example, oxidation, you can oxidize a benzylic position with chromic acid. Now, chromic acid generally just reacts with any kind of um, alkene type stuff. But in this case, the benzene is so especially stable that the chromic acid doesn't mess with it and can only oxidize that that benzylic position the other thing that's special about the benzylic position is its relationship to the benzene ring um, so if you think about like uh, sn1 e1 sn2 e2 type chemistry let's say we have something like this like a benzylic alkyl halide that alkyl halide is actually very labile. It can come off very easily, much like a tertiary alkyl halide. And let's take a look at why. Normally, we wouldn't, we'd say that's fairly unlikely, you know, it's not really going to happen. But now we have all this resonance because of the benzene ring. So we can draw resonance forms where positive charge is kind of passed around the ring. So we can go there, then we can move this one over. Again, these are resonance forms. So here. And then we can even go one more over to the other side. Oops, I drew my hair around, sorry. Okay, so we can pass this, this carbocation around to this carbon, this carbon, and this carbon. The ortho and the para positions can become positive. And that kind of resonance destabilization uh, we know is extremely uh, stabilizing. Anytime you can pass a charge around somewhere via resonance, that stabilizes the charge. Like if you think about the negative charge in acetate that can go in between the two oxygens. Um, this is something that doesn't happen in most of the regular alkyl halides that, we'd see, that we saw in the um, substitution elimination chapter. So when you see things at this benzylic position, any kind of charge, a positive or a negative charge at the benzylic position can be stabilized by passing it around the ring via resonance. So it's, it's delocalized around that ring. Um, and that makes that position especially reactive generally. first reaction of benzene, 
where we're actually going to react something with benzene. So we've, we've been talking about how benzene is so stable, it's so stable, we can't do the normal reactions, um, and that's true. So we have other reactions that we can do instead. With So benzene kind of has its own set of special reactions uh, to, to make its, uh, its derivatives. And this reaction is called electrophilic aromatic substitution. Electrophilic aromatic substitution. Let's take apart that word because we should know all of those uh, terms now. Electrophilic, meaning we're adding uh, an electrophile, not a nucleophile. So much like electrophilic addition to alkenes. Aromatic, we're dealing with benzene and its derivatives. And substitution. So this is not addition like uh, an alkene. This is a type of substitution but it's not nucleophilic substitution, it's electrophilic substitution. So let me show you what that reaction looks like and a couple of the reagents that we use for it, and then we'll take a look at the mechanism. So we often write it like this. Let's say we want to add chlorine. So we'd add Cl2, and then we need a catalyst FeCl3, and that allows us to add one chlorine atom to benzene. Now, that makes it look like addition. It looks like we're just adding. So why is it substitution? What are we substituting for in this case? Can you tell by looking at the structure? Wait, are these going to be almost like mechanisms or like, well, not mechanisms, um, transformations? Because then it kind of looks like it goes in that part where the, uh, the benzylic position is. Um, yes, yeah, yeah. So it, it attaches to benzene. No, this is a single reaction. So this is just a one time, like a one step. It's not a one step thing, but we'll, we'll look at the mechanism in a minute. Um, but for now, yeah, what's we're just looking at what is chlorine substituting for, and it's just H. So even though we didn't draw it because it's a line structure, the reason that it's substitution is the Cl is substituting for the H. All right, so let's take a look at the mechanism and see how that actually works. We're going to look at the general mechanism first, which is true, which is going to work for all of these different electrophiles. And then we'll look at some of the specifics of how some of the different electrophiles do it. But in general, we're looking at something like this. We're starting with a benzene. And then we have some electrophile, some positively charged or at least partially positively charged thing. I'm going to show the H here so we can see all the different steps of the, um, of the transformation. So there's our H, and then here's going to be our electrophile, which we'll just call E plus, okay? Some, some electrophile. In this case, it's going to be a, a chlorine thing. In, uh, in other cases, it'll be other things. So the reason that this is a little bit different from other types of substitution is that this is electrophilic substitution not nucleophilic substitution, which means the benzene itself is actually the nucleophile. So the benzene is going to attack the electrophile. Which gives this type of a compound.
And there's actually still a hydrogen over here, too. So that gives a positive charge, a cation. Um, now, a couple things have happened here. One, benzene has broken its aromaticity. So that means that this has to be a really strong electrophile. And as we'll see, the benzene has to be what we say activated uh, toward the substitution also. Because we talked you know, for the last however long about how specially stable benzene is. And now this reaction is breaking that benzene stability. So this is an extremely um, high energy carbocation intermediate. Yes, the cation is somewhat stabilized by the, uh, by the resonance, but since we've broken that aromaticity, that's not a great situation. So it really wants to um, regain that aromaticity. And the way that it's going to regain the aromaticity is to have a base, again, can be whatever in solution, can actually be a very, very weak base in this case because this thing really wants to get back to aromatic. If a base comes and deprotonates that hydrogen, kind of a, uh, like the second step of an, e2, of an E1 elimination, so we take off the hydrogen and those electrons go back down here, now we've regained the aromaticity. The electrophile attached. And so our byproduct here, we'd have this protonated base like that. So that's the general overall um, reaction of what's going on here. The specifics. The only the 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 way that benzene reacts with the electrophile is always going to follow this general mechanism. What's going to be different from reaction to reaction is just what the electrophile is. So that's what we're going to look at next. So in chlorination and bromination, we generate the electrophile that we're going to use um, because. As we mentioned before, just regular dichlorine is not electrophilic enough to react with benzene. It'll react with an alkene, but it won't react with benzene. So that's where this iron catalyst comes in. Here's our FeCl3. And the chlorine, in this case, the dichlorine actually first, first acts as a nucleophile. making this kind of a strange compound. Which it now is going to have a, a negatively charged formal charge on the iron, positive formal charge on the chlorine. Um, again, this breaks a lot of uh, general chemistry rules, but that's, that's just how it goes sometimes. And then this um, actually will dis dissociate this way. So this whole thing kind of leaves to make a stable FeCl4 minus and a Cl plus. So this is a typical electron, less than an octet charged species here. Oh, my uh, mouse is gone. So six electron charged species here, uh, along with the other byproduct, which is going to be the FeCl4. And so this thing here is the electrophile. This is going to be an extremely strong, extremely reactive electrophile, and that's why it can react with benzene. This also works with Br2 and FeBr3. So that's a way that you can brominate benzene as well with the same mechanism, the same idea. Okay.
So other things that you can add to benzene. All right, other, other electrophiles you can add to benzene. Nitrate with, so we can form nitrobenzene using nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Together. That's one step, those reagents together. Take nitrobenzene. We can sulfonate benzene to make a sulfonic acid uh, with just sulfuric acid. We can alkylate. So we can um, add uh, carbon with an aluminum trichloride catalyst. Oops. So that's going to be like a, like a CH3 or something, but we call it R, so we'll stick with that. And we can acylate using an acyl chloride and aluminum trichloride. So these are all things that we can put onto benzene-like molecules um, to do synthesis, and then we can go on and do other things with that. Mechanism-wise, you don't need to know specifically how all of these different formed in these conditions. Make sure that you know the general mechanism. Uh, you don't need to know the specifics of how every electrophile is formed, but know that general mechanism. And then these will be more like, we would say, to form each one of these types of things, like in the synthesis reactions is where we'll be using them. The book goes through in the next few pages kind of every one of these reactions. how it's used in the in the thing. Um, I'm not going to get uh, too into that at this point. I don't think we need to do that. These notes. Okay. So the last thing we're going to talk about today, kind of in preparation for the next part, is electron withdrawing and electron donating groups. We sometimes call these EWGs or EDGs for short. And th this is about when one of these, when there's a, a something attached, a substituent on benzene, how does that affect the reactivity of benzene itself, of the ring itself? Um, so, for example, and, th and this is going to be determined by resonance uh, generally, but, but some other things as well, as we'll see. So, the, a classic example here is nitrobenzene. 
So a benzene with a nitro group that we're going to draw all the way out. So there's our nitrobenzene. Now what we want to do is we want to think about what types of resonance forms can we draw and how does that affect the electrons of the benzene ring? So how would we draw resonance here? So first thing we have to notice here is the way that we're going to draw resonance is actually pulling it out of the ring toward the nitro group. So since there's no lone pairs on the nitrogen here, we can't draw any resonance forms going this way toward the ring. All of our resonance forms are going to come out of the ring like that. Um, so for example, we can draw this resonance form. this resonance form, there's a formal charge on each, a negative formal charge on each, each oxygen. And there's now a positive formal charge at this ortho position. Okay. We can continue that resonance around the ring. Kind of like what we did before with the benzylic cation stability. So now we have positive charges at, based on the resonance, po positive charges at the ortho and para positions. So ortho, ortho, para. And if we kind of sum that up back to our original structure, remember that resonance structures always contribute to the overall structure. So whatever we can draw resonance structures as, contributes to the overall electronic structure of whatever of, of the molecule. Um, so what that's telling us then is that there are partial positive charges on the ortho and para positions. And therefore, there are also partial negative charges in between, because wherever you make a partial positive charge, there always has to be a negative. Um, you know, there's always going to be that, that uh, attraction and repulsion. So partial positive charges on the ortho position, partial, partial or ortho and para positions, partial negative charges on the meta positions. The other thing that we see here is that this resonance is making the, the ring less nucleophilic because it's pulling the electrons out of the ring. There's more partial positive than partial negative in this ring. Uh, and so that makes this Activating. So we would call this and we would call this nitro group. Where I want to draw here. We would call this electron withdrawing because it's pulling the electrons out of the ring. Uh, so a nitro group then would be deactivating toward electrophilic aromatic substitution. Uh, in electrophilic aromatic substitution, the ring is acting as the nucleophile. So if we're making the ring less nucleophilic by pulling electrons out, then we're making it less able to do these types of reactions. And in fact, nitrobenzenes are very unreactive to electrophilic aromatic substitution. It's very hard, takes a lot of energy, sometimes doesn't work at all, low yields, all that stuff, to try to get um, 
to try to get some of these groups onto benzene rings. And some of the reactions like the, uh, the alkyl addition here that aren't quite as reactive, uh, like these, these couple here, you can't even really do with, with when there are electron withdrawing groups on your benzene. Um, so they're, they're deactivating. that deactivates the benzene um, to the electrophilic substitution. All right, so this is a good time to uh, stop. I think we'll go into electron withdrawing groups on with the book and with the homework. Uh, this, is, this is a lot of new and, and, fair, and sometimes um, confusing stuff. So make sure you get a chance to practice this. And then we'll be getting into more synthesis type transformations. You know, how do you make this from this thing with multiple steps? So uh, please try to keep up with that. But uh, most of all, stay safe and try to keep yourselves together as best you can. Uh, a few more weeks of this before we start the summer semester. Uh, I know you can all do it. So I'll stop the video here. If you, if you want to stick around, if you have other questions, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I will see you Wednesday. Thanks, everybody.